Now let me just say a couple of things on, on this whole issue of sustainability and what we're trying to achieve. And I think the first thing that needs to be said is that in our search for sustainability, sustainable pathways and looking at development and, and development pathways that are sustainable, I think the first words that we need to keep in mind are cut back. And this was uh, articulated in many ways yesterday by Ashish, today by Mr. Ramaswamy Ayer. It's also articulated when it was said that demand is not sacrosanct. Just because there is a demand doesn't mean it has to be fulfilled and growth doesn't always have to be shooting up at this super rapid space. So the first lesson I think, and it is never taken on board because it is so inconvenient <coughs> and politically incorrect, is that you have to cut back on consumption. The first premise of, of sustainability will have to be to reduce aspiration, to reduce, and this has to be done through a very painful process, both bottom up and top down. This needs a lot of investment of thought and policy, etc. But I don't see any other way of trying to achieve sustainability if we continue at the same super rapid growth and the aspiration to the super rapid growth. Because what the super rapid growth is doing, and also the kind of jobless growth that was pointed out um, by my presenters, if you look at India, the most unsustainable outcome of this super rapid growth has been social unrest. I mean, today your Prime Minister himself acknowledges that he says 260 districts, but those of us who work on the ground will vouch that there are many more. But the grid to the government of India practically doesn't run. That is a direct, almost one-to-one -one equation with this exclusive, excluding, super rapid growth that does not take into account anything except, as Deepak was saying, it's not the, the right of capital to go where it wants and do what it does. And that just rocks the bottom of everything that you can hope to aspire in terms of sustainability. If parts of your society and country, this is now, right now, only not only in India, it's happening everywhere. What could be more unsustainable than social unrest in a society, in a country? <coughs> there was some comments on sustainable urbanization, and I would like now to knowingly quote comments that uh, urbanization, the way we are headed with urbanization, as exclusive enclaves, so discreet and so different and so isolated from the rest of whatever this muddle of rural is, that is clearly not going to work. And it is not sustainable. And that cannot be the path that we continue to, to uh, follow. Whether it is housing or, or, uh, or alienation of land for other purposes, the continuum of rural to urban to super urban will have to be far more nuanced and far more integrated if any form of sustainability, either in resource use or in waste uh, uh, management disposal, that will have to be I think, taken on board as a serious, as a serious uh, point of, of where we want to go with, with this. Now, whether the um, the whole question of, of urbanization, whether you can do it or not, I think there are models already that show that it is possible in today's world to do it. And um, I, I invite reference to the township village enterprises of China, which have attempted to create just this bridge between urban and between rural and off-farm, on-farm, in rural areas, connecting it to um, job creation, product de delivery, needs, fulfillment, etc. So this township village enterprise, and I suppose each region will have to develop such models of continuum in, in their own context and in their own, uh, in the context of their own local communities' acceptabilities. But there is something that is happening along those lines already, might be worth looking at. Because what you can't do is this, um, in, in, in under the rubric of sustainability, this kind of preferential cleanup you have you have Delhi with no no diesel and only CNG, but all the guck can go outside. You have removed all the polluting industries out of Delhi, but then you put them into Haryana. That is so bad and so unsustainable, and it has such great acceptance. So if Delhi is clean and Delhi is aiming to be cleaner, it's called sustainable growth in Delhi and sustainable development in Delhi. Nothing could be further from the truth. 30 kilometers outside of Delhi, you've got cesspools of, of uh, every kind of industrial pollution because all the industry has been shifted to the periphery of Delhi. So sustainable development, again, for whom, for who, 
the image model. This has come up repeatedly, and so I just want to uh, flag that. Very critically in the area of food and, and energy and water, as was pointed out. But um, anywhere where resources are used, there is huge amount of unsustainability, inequity, and lack of justice. And the resource use thing is coming to a head now in many, many places around conflicts with Nyamgiri, whether it was the Moxet mines there, or even now water and increasingly over land. So what are the kind of models of sharing of resources that we can possibly suggest or, or, or propose to, do, to think of um, better use of resources? When I served on the Forest Conservation Committee, there was this whole thing of mining. What do you do with mining? How much energy do you want? How much coal do you want to take out? Those are issues. How much do you want to do with hydroelectric? We have the IS saying to perform energy generation. Do you want to do solar, etc.? But when you're looking at mining, you'll mine certain things. You might want this much bauxite and that much iron ore and only so much coal, but you will mine. So what is a sustainable way of looking at mining? This is a terrible um, area, <coughs> which is destructive and very, very inequitable. Who loses everything when the mines are opened up and who gains from all of that? And this is something that all the resource rich areas will have to deal with. One of the suggestions uh, that we made at that time was that whatever has been opened up for mining, let that be done to death and be done with it. But don't open up new areas. Is that a way to deal with it so that you extract with better technologies more and more from wherever you've opened up already? But don't open up more new areas. Because the demands for resources even within reasonable rational limits will continue to exist and it will even be super rapid and irrational. One thing that uh, also struck me during the discussion that it comes to mind is what has happened in terms of essentially looking at life sustainably. Where has that gotten wrong? Rural communities tend to look at life much more sustainably because you have, you have limits to what you can do, number one. And perhaps in recognition of that, and perhaps in recognition of other social factors and economic factors, you realized that there had to be sustainability with recycling, and that it could not be an open-ended exploitation, but not caring about the other end. And there was a lot of social, cultural kind of um, instruments, beliefs, that enforced this and enabled it. I mean, several, several tribal communities hunt sustainably harvest the forest sustainably. And there are ways that, uh, that societies have used to enforce this in a nice way. What has, gone, what has gone shot to pieces is this kind of governance in our urban structures. Better governance, even of, in terms of organizational governance of, social, of, of societies and, and populations, happened in that time. So I think one of the challenges for us facing in this, in this is Innovation, perhaps, in, in uh, organization. How do you socially, uh, how do you innovate to have better social organization now that you've moved into, into urban spaces? And where all the cultural caste, the community, relationship, kinship, all of those barriers, all of those relations are broken, that served as guides and that served as restraints. That's all gone. So what kind of innovation can we expect to invest in? to create similar enabling organizational uh, structures for urban governance or for governance in more urban areas than clearly is the case so far. In the case of food, uh, diversity has been mentioned and diversity is the key to sustainability at all levels. In the case of food production, in the case of agriculture, more than anywhere else. We are trying right now, DKMN is doing an experiment with deploying diversity in different ecosystems to see whether it can help, whether diversity from here can go to help, can go into another ecosystem because of changing climate, etc., to uh, give that greater sustainability. Because the more climate change, the more the climate change kicks in, the more problems you're going to have with adaptability of crop varieties, farming systems, etc., for agriculture and food production. Can you use genetic diversity? to give greater sustainability to food production and agricultural systems in different parts of, uh, of India at the moment. And we are deploying diversity in different ecosystems. Jinkabin itself has a collection of traditional rice varieties. We have taken some from the NDPCR. 
to simply see how resilience can be built through diversity in this kind of way. Um, the, the, this one comes up over and over again and never gets absorbed into any kind of policy. And that is the use of different kinds of knowledge systems and different kinds of sciences. It's been mentioned here also. It's something that I like to mention over and over again when I get the chance. And that is that there are two kinds of sciences. One is the Western empirical kind of science. The other is regional, local uh, scientific tradition, equally valid, validated through a different system with huge amounts of problem-solving capacity. The reason being that community knowledge, community experience has been uh, used to solve problems. And this repertoire of knowledge, this scientific tradition, exists for us to use. So when are we going to start implementing this recommendation and bring it into mainstream? That problem-solving, sustainability, how do you conserve water, how do you most get the most out of soil without destroying it, these are things that communities over the years and generations have known, have learned. Not just in ethnic diversity, but in diversity at, at all kinds of levels, at the level of system, etc. And who's going to govern this? Who's going to take the decisions? There's a lovely article today in the Indian Express, and if you haven't looked at it, pick it up today. It talks about the old India, the, the India of kings, where the king had really so little power. Decisions were taken by the community, either as sabhas or as the equivalents of panchayats. But the king was restricted. And those communities managed to live far more sustainably with a far more equitable use of resources. Because when the community is deciding, it's deciding for the larger common good. When the king was deciding, the king was deciding for a smaller. And that in principle, worked very well because politically the powers of the king were restrained. That's a good lesson to learn. And we have started with the Panchayati Raj, but can we strengthen that and we can, can we mainstream community structures, panchayat structures, mohalla structures as decision makers, at least in terms, in the most key terms of resource management, resource use, distribution, equity, etc. Uh, 